Hello everyone, this is Deborah Richardson and today I am putting the AP in Happy where accounts payable teams are empowered to protect the vendor master file from fraud. This podcast will give a voice to accounts payable team members by talking about the growing reality of cyber attacks in their world and which vendor setup and vendor management techniques they can apply to protect the vendor master file from fraud. Need training? Visit the Vendor Process Training Center to enroll in your choice of weekly live and on-demand training sessions. Plus, get access to Vendor Setup form templates and reference tools that will help you and your team avoid fraud, fines, and bad vendor data. So sign up for a free account to get access to free training sessions, Vendor Process, FAQs, and a resource library with information you need to manage your vendor master file. Visit training.deborahrrichardson.com today. The link will be in the show notes. Remember the days when it was easier to spot an email from a froster because it had poor grammar? Well, frosters have access to generative or Uh, artificial intelligence, just like we do. And now that Froster email you receive may be as grammatically correct as a college application essay. But there are still red flags you can look for and controls you can put into place to mitigate. Keep listening. Welcome to episode 294, Now That Gen AI Solved Poor Grammar, Four Other Signs Your Bank Change Email Is Fraudulent. So first of all, uh, just to give an explanation for generative AI, that is uh, really uh, an example of is ChatGPT for us anyway on the good side because it can... uh, create new text, new images based on our input. And so that is generative AI. Now for the fraudsters, they actually have um, malicious uh, versions of chat GPT. One is called fraud GPT and one is called worm GPT. So if they ask it to do something like create a business email compromise Uh, email that is convincing, it will actually do it. And so that is what they're doing so that when you receive an email, uh, that poor grammar is just soft. And that's really great too, because it really helps those that are not or whose first language is not English. And so now what else do we do? Well, there are other signs or red flags that you can look at, and I'm going to talk about four now. And with each of the four, I'm going to give you uh, a best practice or a control that you can use to try and mitigate it. So let's go ahead and get started. So the first one is urgency is still a sign. And so I know that, um, that has been the advice for the longest, actually right up there with poor grammar. And I still see poor grammar as one of the signs that an email is fraudulent. But today, if you see poor grammar, especially a lot of it is very intentional by the fraudsters because they want to weed out those users that are not going to fall for the next level of the scam that's going to come. So uh, so that's kind of out. But urgency is is still there. And the purpose, of course, is to get us to act quickly without thinking about it or checking up on it. And this one can be tricky for AP, though. I always say because that sense of urgency really already exists just in the normal processing. Uh, invoices turn in late, just before, just after the due date. 
there is no vendor record. And so now it has to hurry up and be set up because it depends on, you know, them being able to ship us something that we absolutely need. So we really have no choice. Uh, and those urgent requests can come from internal team members because sometimes they think everything is urgent. And so fraudsters know this and they really take uh, advantage of it. Now, one thing that you can use to combat it or to mitigate it is to make that confirmation call. And I know um, that a lot of times I, um, I'm i a little against that confirmation call. I'm not really against the confirmation call. I just think it needs to have a better surrounding. Uh, it itself needs to be have a better process and you need to surround it with other controls. And I'm going to put a link in the show notes for a training. It is a paid training, but you can enroll in it where I have And you can learn five to six different steps or controls that you can surround that confirmation call with to make sure you still don't have a fraudulent payment. But um, the confirmation call can still be important that the key though, and we see this because we've seen uh, deep fake audios uh, that have um, uh, been used to Uh, be successful with what that $35 million fraud when the uh, controller received a phone call from their uh, finance director, by the way, and he had a personal relationship with that finance director. So he knew what it it sounded like. And he was still fooled into uh, sending $35 million in payments. But the key is, is that that person, that controller was called. And one of the ways you can mitigate uh, fraud when you, uh, with that confirmation call is you need to initiate it. So initiate it uh, versus uh, having that call come into you. And if you do have a call come into you, that is right. A sign in itself, or maybe a red flag that it is fraud. And If you do have that, I would say um, that you need to do one of two things. Uh, If you receive a call, you don't initiate it. You either need to authenticate them first by asking two to three identifying questions, just like your bank does. Uh, And I'll actually put a link to uh, some free training I have within the authentication validation management workshop. The first section is authentication. And so you do get, um, the training on that. Plus you get a reference template, authentication reference template that you can customize. Um, and actually now you've gotten two things that you can use to mitigate that urgency, that confirmation call when you initiate it. Um, but if you want to have that confirmation on a call that you did not initiate, just make sure you authenticate. And again, I'll put a link in the show notes with, um, that training where it's the first section on authentication is free. All right. So that's one urgency is still assigned Two is change of banking details is just before a big payment. Now what fraudsters do nowadays is they're actually in your vendor's email because they have been very successful at uh, either uh, sending phishing emails that uh, resulted in getting the vendor's actual login information. Uh, or they just purchase the login details or login information from the dark web because everybody's account information has been breached at this point. Uh, and so they're in your vendor's email and they're actually monitoring it so that when they see a big payment is about to be made, that's when they strike and they send uh, a request to change banking, uh, or it actually could be uh, remittance, any remittance details like the uh, remit address if it's a a check payment method. But in any event, they'll monitor the emails and then they will uh, send an bank change request email from within the vendor's inbox. And so it looks legitimate, but a red flag is that it is just before coincidentally uh, a large payment is due. 
Now, one of the ways you can mitigate it is what I just talked about under urgency is that confirmation call. And remember, you either initiate it or you authenticate if they initiate a payment uh, or initiate the call to you. Uh, But you can also, if you have the budget or if you already have a resource to validate uh, bank account ownership, just be careful with that because some fraudsters will create a uh, or open a new bank account using the vendor's own information because remember they're in the vendor's email and so they may create or set up a bank account a new bank account uh, using the vendor's legal name using the vendor's address using the vendor's tax id and so if you do have a solution make sure that they can check account activity and so that can be where uh, the history of that account is short or, and that's a red flag, or uh, that account has, uh, maybe they're using a mule account where, you know, it's a, uh, someone that's receiving a social security payment forever. And that social, uh, social security payment is like $2,500 a month. And then all of a sudden, right, they are, uh, they've gotten a $2.4, $2.5 million payment because maybe they're also reaching out to uh, the vendor's other uh, clients uh, in addition to you as well, right? And so now that's a red flag. Or maybe that other client paid them first and uh, reported them. And so now they've been flagged as a, that account has been flagged as a fraudulent account. And so there are services out there that can either give it a score based on those red flags or identify that that activity has has been found on that account. So that is one way to mitigate um, for the change of banking details uh, when it's just before a big payment. And again, um, you can do the confirmation call uh, process as I described under urgency is still a sign. All right. So the third one uh, is inconsistent contact information. And I know I just talked about Uh, You may uh, receive an email from within the uh, uh, from within the vendor's actual email account because the fraudsters are are in that email account for the vendor. But not always. Uh, Sometimes it is sent from an email address that is just slightly different from an email domain on file. Sometimes you can notice that with the by looking closely at the email domain, but sometimes you can't always find that. It's not just an extra letter. Sometimes they will use a uppercase or an uppercase I in place of a lowercase L, and how would you ever see that? And fraudsters do this often, uh, and I'll give you a great example. Uh, So instead of being in the vendor's actual email, they are not there because they will monitor like the uh, web and they will look for things such as celebrities performing at your company event. So while they are not in the vendor's email, uh, instead they create a new domain with a slightly different email address or email tricks to make you think that it is actually coming from the uh, vendors or celebrities. Uh, email address and it's really not. And so you want to make sure that you're looking for that inconsistent contact information. And even if you can't see it, there is one resource that you can use where you can copy that email domain and don't don't type it, but copy it and then paste it into this site called uh, whois.com slash who is. And uh, I will put a link to it in the show notes, but make sure that you have that who is on the end of that, because otherwise they'll want you to, uh, you'll get all these um, 
uh, instructions on how to create a domain. That's not what you want. You just want to look up what the email, uh, to get the information on the email domain that is on file. And so copy and paste it in the search bar and then click um, search. And what you will see is the registration uh, information for that uh, domain. Now, no, you are not going to know when all of your vendors registered their domains but what you will know is if it was recently registered, because a lot of times, especially in these scenarios where the fraudsters are creating a campaign just because they saw, for example, right, that celebrity is going to be performing at your company event. They know that payment is going to be big. So they create that uh, fake email domain and then send you a request for the bank change. So if you see that the registration date is recent within the last few days or weeks, that could be a red flag or sign that it is a fraudulent bank change request. All right. Now, the last one is the documentation submitted is suspicious looking. And I will tell you that I was on a, so I'm the president of the IOFM uh, chapter, no, Central Atlantic Region chapter. And IOFM, if you don't know, is an accounts payable organization. They've been around forever uh, and they provide education and training in actually not just AP, but also AR. And uh, they have uh, chapters where members can get together uh, and learn from each other, watch presentations, earn CEUs for those that are certified um, with IOFM. And so the uh, IOFM Central Atlantic Region chapter, we have quarterly meetings, um, but I also attend other chapter meetings and at one of the other chapter meetings, one of the leaders brought up this uh, bank letter, vendor bank letter with the banking uh, included on it. And that vendor bank letter turned out to be fraudulent. And it had, she like highlighted everywhere that there was uh, suspicion or just red flags. And I will tell you that entire document was all, was almost uh, highlighted. Um, there was a suspicion around the logo of the bank because it was, wasn't in where it it normally is, but how would you know that? Um, there was suspicion in some of the grammar. And so that thing was just lit up. And what uh, I think should be done to mitigate it is to if uh, is to have your own vendor banking form for them to fill out. Don't just accept the vendor banking on letterhead from the vendor or for the uh, from the bank uh, or for that matter, avoid a check. Uh, you also need to have a vendor banking form that you create that has authenticating data on the form. And you can do that in the form of requiring not just the new banking, but also require the existing banking because they should have that. Uh, and once they get the, or you get that form back with the existing banking, you can check it against the existing bank account information you have on file. Now you can ask for that. Um, I would also say you should ask for the tax ID, the remittance address, contact information, the remittance email address, Right. Just collect information that you may uh, need or that you can also use to authenticate with data on the vendor master file. Another thing I recommend you put on it is the internal employee that the vendor has a relationship with. And all of that information may be enough uh, to deter a vendor from or a fraudster for a from continuing to uh, try to uh, perpetrate fraud because you've now put some obstacles in the way. You're not, not just going to accept what they gave you. You're going to have them fill out a form. You're going to have them put authenticate, authenticating data on the form. And you're even going to ask them to put the internal employee they have a relationship with, which by the way, uh, they may or may not have. And if they have that, 
uh, then if they do submit uh, an internal employee, they, you know, don't know whether or not they run the risk that you're actually going to follow up with that employee, which by the way, you ab- absolutely should do if there's any suspicion. And so uh, what this really does is it deters the uh, fraudster from continuing with the request. And so they may just drop it and go on to the next potential victim. That's not asking for all of those things. All right. So I think that's a great way to mitigate fraud uh, when the documentation submitted is suspicious looking. All right. So that's what I have for today. And I'll just do a quick recap of the four other signs that your bank change email is fraudulent. One, it has or includes urgency. Uh, Two, the change of banking details is just before a big payment. Three, inconsistent contact information. And four, the documentation submitted is just suspicious looking. All right. So thanks, everyone. I hope you enjoyed the 294th episode of the Putting the AP in Happy podcast, where accounts payable teams are empowered to protect the vendor master file from fraud. Don't forget to check the show notes for the links mentioned in the podcast. And if you enjoyed this episode, consider subscribing and writing a review of my podcast on the platform that you use to listen. Stay happy. Stay happy.